So be ready to attend listening sessions on the strategic action plans in June. You'll be hearing a lot from us about that. Our next panelist, come on up. Oh, Part can you the hit the, the power yeah. button there again, please? This is like Actually. a, it's kind of like a disco machine itself with the flashing lights and everything all the time. It's just the gift that keeps giving. Okay, our next panelist is Dr. Emily Pigeon. She's the Director of Conservation International's Marine Climate Change Program. It's focused on finding solutions for coastal and marine adaptation to climate change and on developing marine-based approaches for mitigation through blue carbon. After completing her PhD in environmental engineering at Stanford University, Emily was a research scientist working on coastal ocean oceanography problems at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. At Conservation International, her primary focus is integrating ocean scientists, sciences into effective conservation strategies and field implementation, including addressing the impacts of climate change on coastal and ocean communities and environments. I am very excited to learn about blue carbon myself. So, Emily? I don't know that I can live up to uh, such expectations, but we'll try. So, um, I don't know how many of you have uh, been in touch with the, um, the growing uh, uh, thinking on um, terrestrial carbon. Um, this, uh, through the Kyoto Protocol, which we can sort of discuss at length later, but there is a, uh, a growing movement to um, to consider the value of uh, terrestrial ecosystems, often um, uh, forest systems, for their capacity as both stores um, and uh, uh, sinks of uh, carbon, um, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And looking at sort of financial mechanisms for valuing this um, and uh, giving people credits through a number of different means uh, for uh, that, but the, for preserving or restoring uh, carbon systems terrestrially. And so it's only in the last year or two that a uh, number of organizations have uh, recognized that there are enormous carbon stores in coastal systems um, I'd like to call out to uh, Restore America's estuaries who are, were um, probably one of the first groups in the world um, to really start looking at this with some real seriousness. Um, and uh, um, I, the picture up here is of a um, marshland. Is this one I've stolen from you? San Francisco Bay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, you can see that there are these enormous deposits of carbon, the dirt there, if you like, um, resident underneath um, these uh, wetlands. And we know, for instance, we know, for example, that between 30 and 50% um, of human-caused CO2 in the atmosphere, so climate change causing CO2, um, has been absorbed by the oceans generally. Um, and that can be compared to 20% for forests. So the oceans are actually more important than forests for absorbing carbon dioxide. <coughs> and um, uh, as I, I just previously mentioned, most plant-based ecosystems, whether they be a forest in the Amazon or one of these coastal systems, um, uh, take uh, carbon dioxide from the air or water around them um, and store it either in the plant, which if you're a tree in the Amazon, is a very large store of carbon, and you can see from a these cases that the amount of carbon actually in the plants probably isn't very much, um, or in the sediment below them. And this is where there's a difference between the two. But in the Amazon, there's not much carbon, uh, or relatively uh, not as much carbon um, <coughs> deposited underneath the, uh, the plants. But we have these enormous, very deep systems um, of uh, um, carbon that we find in a number of coastal systems. Um, and specifically that we're looking today at salt marshes or the, the systems that uh, Steve looked at, uh, mangroves and seagrasses. Um, where, um, and this carbon builds up over, over um, time periods of hundreds to thousands of years. Um, so these high, high carbon sequestration capacity and the amount stored there strongly suggest that conservation and perhaps restoration of these key coastal marine systems may be a very cost-effective tool in mitigating climate change, one that we haven't really looked at, and uh, potentially one of the very few low-cost options for actually removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So, um, it's always very hard to give a lecture at 
sort of five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. It's never very popular. But anyway. Well, see, if you have the cocktails, you might actually ignore more of us. But just to go over this very briefly, um, this is a comparison um, between these uh, coastal systems, the seagrasses, the salt marshes, and the mangroves, um, with a number of tropical forests, which is the systems that people have traditionally been thinking about this carbon sequestration issue. And the first thing to note, you'll see that um, the marine systems that we're looking at, typically at least 80% of the carbon is in the sodium of below them. And um, uh, if we think about just the, the sort of green stuff, the foliage, the, the, the plants in these systems, yes, the tropical forests do actually present some of the best options for carbon storage. And that's where people have been looking. Um, and, and when we think of uh, <coughs> carbon in ecosystems, when we think of the Amazon, it's that, those green bars that we've been thinking about. However, if we start to include the um, carbon in the soil in these systems, um, and the carbon that's shown here is only for the first meter of depth. Um, and typically in these coastal systems, it's many, many more meters deep than this. You can see that uh, um, the coastal systems are incredibly efficient, and in fact, much more efficient um, than the terrestrial systems that we've been thinking about. Um, and that the other thing that's interesting about these systems is that the carbon sequestration in coastal systems pretty much continues um, uh, for centuries. The terrestrial systems typically, there's a um, large burst of carbon sequestration that asymptotes off as the, the forest reach, reaches maturity. Um, however, these coastal systems, as we've been hearing, are being lost at an alarming rate. We know that 35% of the world's mangroves have been lost. 29% of the world's seagrasses have been lost. Tidal marshes, the uh, estimates vary great, so great um, significantly and over a large amount because uh, they've been lost for such large periods of time that it's very difficult to come up with an estimate. Best estimate that I've seen is about 50%. Um, and additionally, about 2% of these systems are continuing to be lost globally every year. That's four times the rate of tropical forest deforestation. Um, Degradation of these systems not only results in um, uh, reduced natural sequestration, so when we degrade them, we not only lose their capacity for um, storing the um, carbon dioxide, um, but uh, these sources then become continuous sources of climate change causing CO2. So when you take the lid off these systems, this carbon in the sediment starts eroding away um, and uh, into either the atmosphere or the, um, the water and becomes a continuous source of CO2 continuous climate change causing um, uh, um, emitter. Next slide. Um, so I'm going, this is an example that I've actually taken from Steve here, um, some work that he has done. Um, and the emissions that I've just discussed, um, these emission, continuous emissions that you get from degrading these systems are very significant. Uh, so this work that was done with uh, IUCN and uh, in partnership with Steve, um, we know that uh, soils vary uh, in carbon content um, across landscapes, but a typical coastal uh, wetland releases about 1.1 megatons of CO2 per square kilometre for every metre that you've lost. And uh, again, it's five o'clock and we're before cocktails, so you ask what does that mean? So if we look at this wetland, which is the Sacramento San Joaquin Delta, the one that Steve was just showing previously. And so uh, they, uh, calculations uh, show that drainage of about 1,800 square kilometers of this that um, is historical, and again, you saw that in the maps, the um, historical evolution of the maps that uh, Steve showed. Um, most of this drainage was for agriculture over the last century. And that drainage has led to um, some 0.9 gigatons of CO2, or 0.9 billion tons of carbon dioxide um, being released. And um, this is a quarter of the total above ground pool of carbon in California forests. <coughs> so, it's, so it's the same as um, the release of a quarter of the carbon in California's forests has been released due to um, uh, drainage of um, this one, one delta. In the San, and, and, and we know that there are many more wetlands in California. Um, now that 
That's thousands of years of carbon released in about 100 years. Um, and so, and this is a continuous source. Each year between five and seven and a half million tons of CO2 continue to be released from this one delta. Uh, and this is equivalent to one, one and a half percent of California's annual emissions, which is pretty significant numbers. Um, so where this is where the restoration work that Steve is doing, this wetland and its potential elsewhere, is incredibly important because by restoring this and putting the lid back on, the natural lid back on this, you're doing two things. You're arresting those emissions. And uh, you are also um, restoring the capacity of these systems to, to sequester further um, carbon dioxide. So there, there is potentially good news here, and restoration of these systems is, is it. Clearly, it's better to not drain or destroy them in the first place. Um, but but uh, there, is, uh, there is hope and, and, and um, there is uh, sort of significant value to this. Um, next slide. So um, the real question is, can this blue carbon, if you like, leverage better management, conservation, and restoration of these coastal systems? And there are a number of approaches that could be taken here. Um, we can use this uh, to, to uh, increase recognition of the mitigation value associated with these systems uh, through national policy and action, um, and then through international means working with the IPCC, UNFCCC, um, and some of the ocean policy mechanisms. Um, on the ground at local levels, we can be um, looking at uh, improved uh, management and regulation, um, specific actions aimed at uh, ensuring the, the high carbon systems st uh, maintain the store carbon. We can look at restoration of these areas um, and so that we can minimize and reduce emissions. And um, we can look at the potential financial and other um, incentive mechanisms um, to um, uh, provide a basis for conservation and restoration of these systems. And that has a number of different ways we can look at it. The simplest is some sort of philanthropic giving um, that goes through some of the more innovative conservation incentives that are um, being sort of developed right now through to um, financial incentives for actual carbon credits. Now, this has not been done terrestrially yet and is still somewhat controversial, um, but uh, we need to be looking at these things. So there are, but the, uh, the devil is in the details here. There are a number of very big questions as to uh, if this is possible. And so last slide. Uh, there are three organizations, Conservation International, who I work with, IUCN, um, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, which is sort of the ocean arm of UNESCO, have got together and have uh, put, um, our, uh, la have launched the International Blue Carbon Initiative. Um, the key piece of this that has just have uh, started in the last couple of months are two working groups, a science working group where we have about 20, 25 experts in the three ecosystems looking at uh, monitoring to really ask, is this possible? How much carbon is there, is there in these systems? Where is it? How would you go out and measure it if you're a manager? Um, uh, is this sort of viable scientifically when you delve down into the details? Um, we are just about to launch in the next month the um, policy working group that looks at all the various mechanisms out there that this can be incorporated into both climate and um, uh, ocean policy. Um, there is a number of US uh, organizations that we've been involved in that, but the, there is a large emphasis on making it internationally relevant. Um, and there are other pieces that, to this that need to be, to be looked at. There is uh, looking at pilot projects um, we're working um, with Restore America's estuaries to look at potential sites within the US, including the San Francisco Bay. Um, but uh, Conservation International works pretty much exclusively um, outside the US, and so we're looking at um, partners um, in other tropical sites, typically, um, where we can develop um, uh, pilot sites. There is research, there are gaping holes in the knowledge as to how we can do this, and there's um, need for um, newer research to fill those and then obviously a capacity building on helping people from uh, coastal managers all the way up to high level policy 
um, into that, including international policy and what this actually means. And so we're trying to put all these pieces together. This is meant to be a very open process and we're very um, keen to have um, groups who are interested in doing pieces of these coordinate with us. Um, we're enthusiastic to talk to people about everything that's possible. It's, it's meant to be helping put a bit of structure on um, thinking about this um, uh, in an international perspective yeah. and um, uh, bringing together everybody that's interested in, in working on this. So with that, I think I'll, I'll leave us to um, Great. Thank you. Great. All right, if we can have our uh, uh, panel come on up here. I will. You know that I'm in uh, um, it. seems like, like a lot of these issues, you learn, the more you learn about it, just the more terrifying things look with the, with the destruction of the, the environment, but also the compounding impacts on the climate, which then you know, create those feedback loops and even more more larger changes. But the thing that you, you said, Emily, at the end there, um, just very briefly, putting a cap, putting a cap on top of these systems, basically restoring the vegetation layer, restoring the ecological processes, allows us to arrest that emission, those emissions of carbons immediately, or at least to say, in, in a shorter time frame. So we can actually have some opportunities with immediate restoration to address <coughs> a pretty significant impact on the climate. I think that's a, you know, that's a sign of, of hope there. That's a good thing. Um, Stephen, let me ask you, you had talked about the uh, South Bay Cell Pond Restoration mm -hmm. Program. This is something that is a 50-year project, about a billion dollars, I suspect, over the course of uh, a good part of the 50 years, yeah. right? So there's a lot of different pieces to that, and relatively it's a pretty large landscape. How do you go about uh, prioritizing the, er the areas where you uh, can do the most immediate restoration? Where do you, where do you find, is it, is it an ecological hotspot? Is it a political opportunity? Is it both? Oh, well, if you, where, does a, where does a firm like yours, where do you, how do you go about that process? Well, within the South Bay Salt Ponds Project itself, um, we have a lot of play available there um, because the state now owns all of the land and um, it, it's, it's identifying, you know, in part it's, you know, some of those salt ponds right now are really good habitat for endangered species, which is both good and bad because if you want to, it's conflicts with restoration. And so identifying which of the areas are most readily available for restoration is, is, is one of the first tasks. Where can you do it without causing any flooding issues, et cetera, et cetera. And so, of course, the first sites we did to make sure that we had a project in the ground within five years was could you pick the easiest one mm -hmm. and go with that, and that's one of the ones on the edges. Um, but it, it becomes progressively more complicated as you, as you get further into it. Um, across the whole bay, it's more opportunistic. There's a whole strategy, there's a plan, there's a bay, a bay plan that exists, you know, where people, scientists and uh, conservationists got together and identified, you know, what could they do within San Francisco Bay? And then as land becomes available, then they pick off pieces from that plan. So the most critical element really is to have a plan in hand where you can say, okay, this is available, what shall I do with it? I'll do this with it. And that was, that's probably the most important thing you can do. Tim, you gave, you gave us the, the vision thing, right? The big scale, think big. That's what I'm shooting for. <laughs> Which is a great idea, I think. We can all agree. Um, you you worked on some uh, you know pretty scalable restoration projects, particular streams, particular watersheds. Thinking region wide, um, thinking even broader with the the network of Restore America's estuaries groups, maybe a national strategy. Um, where do you start? You're more on the, on the I'm picking on you now because you're more on the East Coast and you and you dealt with uh, New Jersey and the Atlantic Coast there, which has had a pretty long history of human habitation and land change. Right. Right. So what are, your, some, what are your priorities there when you think about coastal restoration in an area like that? Are you focusing on particular uh, habitat types? Are you looking at endangered species and then of course around there? Well, I think you do. Where, where do you start in building the vision thing? I mean, we, we run the same sort of triage that Steve was describing. Um, and, and part of it is because we, we like to work locally up and then from the top down at the same time. So on the Barnegat Bay, projects, we knew that the science was telling us that stormwater 
was the vehicle by which the nutrients were coming into the bay. And we knew we had a huge, uh, I mean, there's literally 30% uh, of that watershed is urbanized. So we knew we weren't gonna be able to, to restore the bay or, or uh, halt its degradation by simply preserving the rest of it. We were already over thresholds that the science tells us are you know, the triggers for eutrophication. So, um, and, then, and then it had the added value of being, as I said earlier, sort of construction project oriented. And, um, and we knew that um, um, that would present us opportunities to bring certain parts of the political pieces into play there. Um, on, the, on the Delaware Bay work, we are, we've been working for years about uh, the connection between horseshoe crabs and migratory shorebirds that go from Tierra del Fuego to the Arctic. Stopover, they, uh, the, the horseshoe crabs were severely overfished in the early 90s. So the, the goal there is to bring the horseshoe crab populations back up. And what we found is that the availability of spawning beaches for the crabs, for those who don't know the life history, they come up on the beach in May and June, they lay their eggs. At the same time, the birds are coming in completely decimated from a 6,000 mile you know, flight from, uh, from South America. So we knew if, if the key to the ecology of the interrelationship between those two species was to create more opportunity for the crabs to do their thing, then we, we went through and we identified those, those beaches. So we let, the, we let the science drive it to a certain extent, but then I think it does get, you have to always look at it opportunistically to figure out what piece is teed up best. And, and so the point I was trying to make was we should be doing more stage setting, so to speak. We should be trying to make sure that we're consciously creating our own opportunities by looking for what's going to work in the political uh, atmosphere that we're in. I think that's an important lesson. A uh, couple, of, a big part of the concept, you know, that the Ocean Policy Task Force looked at, a uh, big part of the concept, the National Ocean Policy itself, is simply agency coordination mm -hmm. in the federal family and in state agencies and even on the, on the municipal level. Understanding that a lot of the particular ocean agencies, NOAA particularly, uh, Bomer, Bom, Bomer, Bomer, Bomer. Um, <laughs> getting those agencies to work together, but also, you know, I'm interested in, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has been involved in a lot of restoration opportunities, uh, Army Corps particularly. What about some of the larger uh, land management agencies that we have, like say national? So NCRS, uh, Agriculture. Um, Agriculture, Park Service, a lot, a lot, these are, you know. So I think that has agencies. been one of the advantages of this new policy and the process because it has actually brought people to the table and has actually started getting these agencies that typically weren't meeting on a regular basis. So some of the bigger land management agencies, like you were saying, like Agriculture, DOT, who has a lot of infrastructure yeah. projects, really coming consistently to the table to talk about, all right, here's the way we're giving out grants. It really is affecting the restoration project. We weren't taking that into consideration before. But now we know, we know that's happening. Let's make sure we put that in our thinking. And so I, I, I have started to see that. Um, I think you will see more of that over time. I think, I'm sorry, that was a little bit wonky what I talked about, all the strategic action plans. But um, it, has, it has been essentially the forum to get people and these agencies, these land management agencies, to start thinking about some of the downstream effects of what they're doing upstream um, and vice versa. So I, I, I didn't know, don't know if that's what you were hitting on. Well, Do you have I, another I question think there? The, you know, we have ocean agencies mm -hmm. that generally uh, uh, tend to work together well. Sometimes they yeah. do, sometimes <laughs> they don't. But I think there's a lot of opportunities in those uh, other agencies that are involved. Yep. 25 entities involved in the National Ocean Council. A lot of them think about their more specific their role. It's kind of a new thing for them to integrate together and to start to think together, right? So, for example, again, in New England, we have a huge problem with nitrogen pollution in Lake Champlain. Yeah. The big problem the big part of that is agricultural runoff. That has a lot of downstream impacts. That's something that is very much an uh, issue of focus in Vermont, but it also has a lot to do with the with the rest of the country. So you don't think about USDA or even the, the state agriculture agency as an ocean agency, but it's pretty important for a lot of very distressed uh, river herring that are more that are more coastal. Mm -hmm. But all that all those water quality issues certainly yeah. floating on the stream. So 
thinking about and involved in those kind of partners as well. It's going to be <coughs> it's going to be a big step. Let me ask you something uh, specifically on the strategic action plans. Um, when the uh, call for comments was put out, you said you focused specifically on near term, mid term, and longer term. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that we can hope to see from the administration more immediately on coastal habitat and restoration opportunities? What are the short term opportunities so we can do now, especially with the budget? So I think in the near term, you'll see a lot of leveraging resources, um, leveraging projects between agencies and the leveraging public-private sector partnerships so where they can get more bang for your buck. I think those um, longer term actions, you'll see a little bit more forward leaning, a little bit more, okay, how can we work some money into the budget um, that's consistent with what the president wants. Um, so the near-term actions, you see some restoration projects and you see restoration projects in multiple agencies, some which have been coordinated, some which um, they're looking on ways to leverage and maximize those dollars between agencies, you, like you said, you wouldn't typically think of, such as Agriculture, um, Army Corps, DOT, with those typical ocean agencies, EPA, NOAA, BOMER, Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we are technically five minutes over our time, so I know there's a couple questions here. Can we do that now? Anybody? Yes. If you can help everyone know who you are, we ask questions. Yes. Sandra Sherman with Marine Conservation Institute. Um, this is a great panel. Thank you, guys. Um, I have two quick logistical questions for Teresa and then a thought question for all of y'all. Teresa, beyond NOAA, what NOC members are including on national ocean policy, CMSP, any of that funding in the FY, uh, the fiscal year 2012 President's budget? And will the regional planning bodies be used for regional priority setting for non-CMSP national priority objectives like the restoration objective? And then for the big thought for all of y'all, restoration in the ocean wasn't really mentioned, and it's hard can't drive a bulldozer out there. Can we talk about ocean restoration beyond the near shore environment? So I can start and answer those two first question. Um, first, or the second one on the regional planning bodies, those regional planning bodies will really be focused on CMSP and getting that process up and running, at least for the first couple of years. Um, I think it depends on what the regions want to do. Um, down the road and and how they form them whether they use the re existing regional ocean partnerships Whether it's a subcommittee of that whether it's a separate body um, I Think that they can definitely be used as a seed for those regions who haven't had traditional regional ocean partnerships to then continue dialogue into other areas But for the first couple of years they will be just focused on the regional planning bodies um, So the regional, the, so that is a good question. Part of this strategic action plan is talking about specifically on regional ecosystem restoration efforts. They have been asked to prioritize um, areas in that plan. Um, it's not an easy task because there are a lot of efforts across the country. Um, and I think it's actually been something people have been struggling with, of how do you prioritize one area versus another, but you have to start somewhere. So. You might see some pilot projects come out. You might see um, some of the larger efforts that have been ongoing getting better aligned with the national ocean policy. So we have a lot going on down in the Gulf. We have a lot going on in the Great Lakes. Um, I Better aligning those efforts with what the National Ocean Council is doing as well, we'll you, I think you'll see in the near term. Um, I have a question and follow up right there. Who yeah. are the people who are on these strategic planning councils who are making these decisions and what to put as well in that? And I, 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 you're, I don't mean to skip your question. Yep, that's a very good question. So the way the National Ocean Councils construct it, it has two interagency policy committees, one that's focused on ocean resources and one that's focused on um, science and technology. And those two bodies are the bodies that are <coughs> responsible for these strategic action plans. The National Ocean Council ultimately has the ultimate decision 
at that level, but those two bodies are really the bodies that operationalize the decisions. They're made up of the 27 entities that, that sit on the National Ocean Council, um, and so they, that would be the bodies that are responsible. And then to your second question, how are citizens and stakeholders really having input into this process? There are several ways. So there are two advisory bodies to um, the National Ocean Council. There is a stakeholder advisory body, ORAP, um, which has served a different role in the past, um, which is the Ocean Resources, Research and Resources Advisory Panel. Um, and you have a broad suite of stakeholders on that, from academia to industry, um, across the board. So they have a direct ongoing role in making sure we are taking into consideration and looking across the board. Um, the second body is the Governance Coordinating Committee, and that is actually a non-FACA um, body that's made up of state, tribal, and local representatives. So they really are focusing on, okay, how are we integrating across the levels of government? Here's what's happening in our region on the West Coast, or here's what's happening in our region in the Pacific Islands. Uh, is that being taken into account? And, um, and so they're there to advise, and that's a new body they're there to advise the National Ocean Council. Um, in addition, um, they have in the process, and I hate talking process, but in the process, they have tried to really create opportunities for stakeholders to have a broad and continual level of input into these priorities. Um, the regional listing sessions coming up is one, uh, and the and that outline, these are just early in the process draft outlines that are coming out. So that's why we are coming out with them now because we want people's feedback. We really want to get that input early into this process. There will be another opportunity once the there is actual full draft plan um, in the fall to comment again. Um, but we want to get in the drafting mindset um, and in the drafters' minds what people really want and and have that factored in. So. I, don't, I hope that answers your question. And then to your other question on the dollar figures, um, I, everybody I know is looking at their budget during this tight budgetary times. The, the fiscal question, the budgetary question always comes up. I think besides NOAA, there are definitely other agencies looking at their, um, at their funding and their budgets. I think some of the agencies are waiting to see, okay, how do we fit into these action, these specific actions that we're identifying to redirect some resources to, to help make this happen. Um, so that thinking is going on at the same time we are trying to develop these plans. I think in the out years, so FY13 and beyond, one thing that the EO created and the National Ocean Policy created is that this National Ocean Council it will sit down together with OMB and talk about, okay, how do we better coordinate across all these agencies, the ocean budgets? Um, and so there will be a budget guidance memo for those out years and then continuing on. So first couple of years it's going to be a little bit harder uh, because just by the nature of the budget planning process and how far out that starts but that that is being taken into consideration um, does anyone have any deep thoughts on the ocean restoration component <coughs> start with the estuaries small, small topic, <laughs> start with the estuaries you hear that great idea why is that Tim well I think I, I, Dr. Earl, I think, mentioned it, you know, or somebody mentioned it earlier in one of the panels. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure, so when we say, what is ocean restoration? What does that mean? Are we talking water quality issues? Are we talking about the ecological you know, structures between the fish, uh, probably the living populations out there? And, you know, and from my mind, a good portion of those ecosystems started from the shore and work out. Yeah. Stephen made the point in one of his slides, um, there was a bullet, a list of bullets, eight or so. Um, create, recreate ecological processes. Don't just mimic structure. And I think that is a very important lesson that's been learned over, you know, since Aldo Leopold, since the, the history of restoration as we've actively tried to implement it and learn from successes and failures. That's an important part. Estuaries contribute at least, I'm going to say 75% because Jamie Chanko said that in past uh, sessions. 75% of um, some portion of their, I'm going to get this wrong now that I said that, 
some portion of, of their life cycle. Life history. So life history. history. Yeah. Seventy-five percent of ocean species benefit from estuaries at that point. So think about it as nurseries or as fountains or something. It's a great place to start. Estuaries also involve what? Fresh water and salt water. So all that land use that happens around our streams and rivers, you know, think about the, the, the cords of life running through the landscape, that's a great place to start the restoration and, and good things flow from there. Casey, does that answer your question? Thank you. Do you have a question? Um, yeah. Um, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Heather Spence. Um, I'm a marine biologist and I'm setting up a center for sustainability in Cancun, Mexico, which is based on the idea of respect, restore, replace. If anybody's interested in that, you should come talk to me. Um, but the, I wanted to ask you guys about um, citizen science and um, any experiences you've had um, working with citizen scientists or where you think there might be potential role for citizen science in restoration? The, the, the Literal Society has a fish tagging program that's 45 years old. So right now we have about 1,500 recreational anglers on the East Coast primarily who uh, catch and release, you know, um, it started, it really started on, on, well actually started on sharks back in the mid 60s and then grew, got kind of focused on game fish, striped bass in particular, but uh, and we collect all that data, it's reported back to us, you know, fundamental biometrics, and we then collate it and give it to National Marine Fisheries Service. And and in my view, you know, it's been involved in for you know, six or seven years and out at 45, um, the information is not being used well enough, so, but the, but it's collected very well, and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Council certifies the program, so their scientists have looked at the way the data is collected, the way it's managed, the way we sort of safeguard it, you know. And then, um, the fundamental part of it is we don't try to manipulate the data, we just collect it and we send it to them, and, you know, then they use it, you know, uh, for various things. We, we have lots of experience working with uh, countries around the world um, with uh, sort of uh, what, what's called with integrating science into the local coastal and ocean management and the citizen science, if you want to call it that, is, is, a, fun is a fundamental piece of that. I can give you a number of examples um, uh, in a number of places. With one that comes to mind is that uh, we've been looking at spillover effects from MPAs in Brazil and the local fishermen are very much on board with the no-take areas because they were actually out there counting fish and have sort of been very much involved in the data collection associated with those spillovers. So um, it's not my work in particular but uh, if you wanted to contact me afterwards I think my email's around I can connect you with the right person at CI that, that's been doing that work. Okay. Uh, we're about 15 minutes over our uh, established time. I want to have a, a reminder, a recognition, and a thank you. Reminder is that the strategic action plans for the National Ocean Policy will be out. The outlines will be out on June 1. That will trigger a month long, month long, we can say yeah. month of June, uh, session of, of round of listening sessions in different regions across the country. This is a phenomenal opportunity to get involved and actually help to create what the National Ocean Council is gonna implement, how they're gonna implement the National Ocean Policy. There's nine priority objectives, so each priority objective will have a strategic action plan. Ecosystem protection and restoration is one of those. So that's a, that's <coughs> a reminder. Uh, recognition is, is for uh, Jeff Benoit of Restore America's Estuaries who helped organize this workshop. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you all. Thank you very much to our panel, and uh, thank you all for putting up with our uh, creative uh, approach to technology. So, <laughs> I, I told the bar is open. <laughs> <laughs>